So um, sorry for all this uh, technological things. Uh, everybody knows we're used to Zoom that can be problems. But uh, I want to welcome everybody to our, this is our last of our um, fall semester programming. <clears throat> this is the fourth of the, uh, the ones we have done. And uh, I just wanted to, do, um, before we introduce Dr. Pat, um, I wanted to, as usual, thank a whole bunch of people, including, of course, Gary Brown, who is going crazy here, but <laughs> trying to get all this technology together. But he's done a wonderful job uh, of uh, behind the scenes, trying to get all this going. Um, also, um, Judy Brown, who's working with me on fundraising and our advisory committee, um, which is always behind us. Uh, Kathleen Pearl is our Dean of the um, human of the Humanities, of the um, Social Science and Education, uh, Jewish Federation of New Bedford, and the Fall River Jewish Appeal, as well as Bristol County Savings Bank, um, who have helped to fund us. Also, the um, individual people who have contributed, which we really appreciate. It all helps us to uh, provide this programming. We, um, we have programming which is um, scheduled for the spring. Um, and we're also working on a workshop that we're doing for regional teachers in the, um, in the summer. So despite the um, COVID, and everything that that brings, we're trying to be as active as we can. And I thank everybody for being here and also for supporting supporting us. This is, as you know, very important um, work that we're doing and that we're part of, um, actually there's recently, there was a program the United Nations has sponsored, uh, the State Department are, is also sponsoring programming around Holocaust education. So everybody is, is is interested and concerned about that this education goes forward given you know the atmosphere that we have been living in um so we're just a part of that now let me introduce our our speaker we are very um pleased to have professor i would get your name avinom pat dr avinom pat who is the um Director of the Center for Judaic Studies in Contemporary Jewish Life at the University of Connecticut Stores. We first, a couple of us saw Dr. Pat uh, when he was at Hart University of Hartford. He's now moved on to UConn, um, but he is a um, accomplished scholar in, the, in addition to running these programs in the field of modern Jewish history and Holocaust studies. Uh, he's published extensively in uh, areas of Holocaust, Jew, uh, displaced persons, and the aftermath of the Holocaust, which will be the subject of this of this talk, as well as um, American Jewish fiction, and um, among many other books and publications. Recently, yeah. he has a book out recently called um, "Finding Home and Homestead: Jewish Youth and Zionism." in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And um, one that just was just recently published, very uh, understanding and teaching the Holocaust, which is um, very important work. Um, and for those of us who uh, teach the Holocaust to be able to uh, understand and learn more about the most effective ways of teaching this challenging subject and Holocaust and genocide. So uh, I'm gonna look forward to reading that book. Um, so with all that introduction, Dr. Pat. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Ron. And I appreciate the invitation. I'm very happy uh, to be here today. I, as you said, I, I wish I could be doing it in person. Um, I think we originally scheduled this uh, lecture for March 26th, which uh, was, was just about uh, a week or so after everything shut down. and. Um, I'm grateful that at least we're able to do this via Zoom, uh, and I, but I hope to uh, follow it up at some point with an in-person meeting. Um, Ron, just so I know, it, it, what's the how how what time do you have to end by today in terms of the program? Well, 
ultimately 530. So we okay. have, uh, you know, usually whatever your presentation and then questions and then answers. Perfect. So That's somewhere perfect. That, yeah, that no, I want to make sure to leave plenty of time for, for Q&A. Sure. Um, so let me um, share my screen so you can see uh, see my PowerPoint because um, I have a number of images that I, I want to uh, share with you as part of my presentation um, today. And let me just go into slideshow. There we go. Okay. So um, as, as, Ron, as Ron indicated, a lot of my um, research has focused on Jewish life in the aftermath of the Holocaust. Um, and on what, when I started working in this area, um, probably about 20 years ago, um, was sort of an underexamined aspect of Holocaust studies research, which was what happened to survivors in the immediate aftermath of the war, um, in particular in the Jewish displaced persons camps. And one of my efforts in sort of uh, my work in the field of Holocaust studies has been to try to broaden our chronology um, to not just look at the years either 1933 to 45 or 1939 to 45, but to expand out and ask students and scholars in the community to think about what happened in the years after 1945, what happened in the years, in the days, weeks, and months after liberation. And Ron mentioned that I um, just had a, a new volume that came out that I've co-edited called Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. And indeed, my one of my contributions to this volume is a chapter on understanding and teaching Jewish displaced persons and how to uh, incorporate this into our standard teaching about the history of the Holocaust. Now I show you on the um, cover slide an image which um, is a picture of Holocaust survivors taken within the first year after liberation. Um, this is uh, less than a year after liberation and it's survivors on a farm, an agricultural training farm in post-war Germany, um, not far from where they were liberated. And I show this to you because it's not always the image that we have in our mind of survivors in the aftermath of the war, uh, six months after liberation. They look young, they look healthy, they look like they're going out to work, um, they're smiling. It's not the image that we necessarily have when we think about Holocaust survivors. And I'm gonna come back in my talk and explain to you a little bit more about what's happening in this picture. But I wanna start with an image that you might be more familiar with, something that you're more likely to expect. And I know probably all of you are familiar with the name of a place called Buchenwald. The concentration camp, which was built by the Nazis in 1937, was one of the largest concentration camps in the Nazi universe of camps. And it stirs all sorts of associations and images. After Kristallnacht, which we observed the 82nd anniversary of this week, November 9th and 10th, um, after Kristallnacht in November of 1938, almost 10,000 Jews were sent to Buchenwald of 30,000 who were rounded up and arrested and sent to con concentration camps on the night of the broken glass. And during the war, Buchenwald became a major center of forced labor with over 100,000 prisoners in its subcamp system by February of 1945. Upon seeing Buchenwald liberated on April 11th, 1945, a member of the 333rd Engineers Regiment stated, my feeling was, quote, that this was the most shattering experience of my life, unquote. A US Army chaplain trying to make sense of the carnage wrote to his wife, quote, this was a hell on earth if there ever was one. And after photographing Buchenwald, Margaret Bork White wrote to her editor at Life Magazine, quote, the sights that I have just seen are so unbelievable that I don't think I will believe them myself until I've seen all of the photographs. One American journalist wrote, Buchenwald is beyond all comprehension. You just can't understand it even when you've seen it. Now, this is the image that we have in our minds of a place like Buchenwald but I wanna share with you something that's a less likely image for us to consider. In the case of the aptly named Kibbutz Buchenwald, just a few days before they opened their agricultural training farm, young survivors of the concentration camp of Buchenwald 
approached a young Jewish army chaplain by the name of Herschel Schachter, asking for his assistance to create an agricultural training farm not far away from the newly liberated concentration camp. Um, not far away from the liberated concentration camp. And with the assistance of Herschel Schachter and an American colonel, the kibbutz secured a farm near a former Nazi estate near Egendorf, making kibbutz Buchenwald, what would be the first kibbutz Hachshara or Zionist training farm to be formed in the DP camps of the American zone of Germany on June 3rd, 1945. Now, this is not the image that we have in our mind when we think of survivors in Germany in the aftermath of the war. But eventually, this model would become such an appealing option for thousands of Jewish youngsters in post-war Germany that 40 such agricultural training farms would be opened on the estates of former Nazis and German farmers, thanks in no small part to the assistance of Jewish soldiers and chaplains who worked together with survivors after the war. The young uh, survivors who formed Kibbutz Buchenwald kept a diary of their experiences in the first weeks after liberation. And indeed, many of those young survivors who by and large were between the ages of 17 and 35, they had been chosen because they were younger, because they were stronger, they had been selected to stay alive for work. They wrote about the disorientation, the chaos of those first weeks after liberation. And they wrote about their considerations after the camps were immediately liberated. In the diary of Kibbutz Buchenwald, they wrote, and I'll quote here, the Jews suddenly faced themselves. Where now? Where to? They saw that they were different from the other inmates of the camp. For them, things were not so simple. To go back to Poland, to Hungary, to streets empty of Jews, towns empty of Jews, a world without Jews to wander in those lands, lonely, homeless, always, always with the tragedy before one's eyes, and to meet again a former Gentile neighbor who would open his eyes wide and smile, remarking with double meaning, what, Yankel, you're still alive? Yes, the Jews faced themselves. Was our tragedy only beginning? As a number of Jewish survivors of Buchenwald wrote soon after liberation, in the wake of tremendous destruction, the future was uncertain. And you can see here on this map that comes from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, many of the sites where uh, concentration camps were liberated in the very end days, weeks, and the last month of the war as US forces advanced from, uh, from the West and Soviet forces advanced from the East. And we can see where many of the major concentration camps, including Buchenwald, which I alluded to, as well as Dachau in the southern part of uh, Bavaria near Munich, Landsberg, and other sites that would become important sites of the organization of uh, the survivors in the aftermath of the war. Uh, many of them were greeted by uh, American soldiers who liberated the camps, uh, including one here that I'm going to spend a little more time in a few minutes telling you about. You can see here an American Jewish army chaplain in the middle of the picture here by the name of Abraham Klausner, who was in fact the second Jewish army chaplain to arrive in Dachau just a few weeks after liberation at the end of April of 1945. And this is the situation that confronted them. You had some Jewish army soldiers, some Jewish chaplains, American GIs liberating the camps, finding um, Jewish survivors in various states of um, malnourishment, disease, some very near to the edge of death, most of them uh, still uh, in their concentration camp clothing. You can see here, this is a picture of the Rabbi Herschel Schachter that I mentioned before, conducting services for Buchenwald survivors not long after liberation. This is in May of 1945. And you can see here, most of the survivors are still clothed in their concentration camp uniforms. Now, in the first days and weeks following the liberation of Germany by the Allied forces, the country was inundated with liberated captives of the Nazi regime who sought to make sense of their new situation for which they had long hoped. And indeed, with the conclusion of the war on May 8, 1945, 
there were over 10 million forced laborers, prisoners of war, displaced persons from all sorts of countries, not just Jewish displaced persons, but displaced persons from Poland, from the Ukraine, from Lithuania, from countries all over Europe. People had been displaced by the war, and most of them flooded the roads of Germany in their desire to return home. Now, you can see here on this map, um, Germany, after liberation, was divided into four zones of occupation. So most of what would become the Jewish DP camps were, in fact, in the American zone of occupation, which you can uh, see here on the map in the tan area. Just to the, uh, to the west of the American zone was the French zone of occupation, which is in the purple um, area. The largest DP camp, um, Bergen-Belsen, in fact, was in the British zone of occupation, which you can see here in the north. And there was a Soviet zone, and Berlin was right in the middle of the Soviet zone of occupation. And in the same way, Austria was also divided into four zones of occupation. As I said, though, the majority of the Jewish population, perhaps 35,000 out of about 50,000 surviving Jews, and that is a rough estimate because we estimate about 50,000 Jews were liberated from the concentration camps um, in, uh, in April of 1945. Thousands died in the first few weeks after liberation from the cumulative effects of persecution, disease, and malnourishment. But the estimate is that about 35,000 uh, surviving Jews were in the American zone of occupation um, in uh, May of 1945. And while millions of displaced persons were successfully returned to their homes by the United States Army, there were close to 1.5 million refugees who avoided repatriation for fear of either being branded collaborators or within the small category, there were the Jews who for other reasons did not want to return home. And the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration called UNRWA also created an overarching umbrella body to try to deal with the refugee population after the war. And they estimated that out of 1.5 million displaced persons in Germany, Austria, and Italy, about 50,000 or 3% 3, 3 were Jews. Um, Jews, as we know, were least likely to have survived the war, and this constituted this small minority of refugees in Germany upon liberation. And indeed, as we saw um, immediately following liberation, while most of the 10 million displaced persons, POWs and forced laborers in Germany made the decision to return home with ease, as was articulated in the diary of Kibbutz Buchenwald, the 50,000 or so Jewish DPs did not face such a clear decision. They were unsure of what awaited them at home. They were awfully, often fairly certain that their families had been destroyed during the war. And those who decided to stay in a DP camp also had to face the fact that this meant continuing to live with collaborators who had also refused to return home. In this initial period, displaced persons were categorized according to uh, national origin, which meant that um, they were either defined as coming from enemy or allied countries. And those Jews who did survive were frequently placed with former collaborators from their places of origin in displaced persons camps. So this meant that you would have Lithuanian Jewish survivors who were placed with other Lithuanian DPs. Even if those displaced persons who had been POWs or had been collaborators during the war um, had been collaborators, Jews might be housed with them in the same way, just as if you had Ukrainians or Poles um, who had been collaborators. It was according to national origin. And this was, as you can see by the definition, in keeping with allied policy, which defined a displaced person as, quote, any civilian who, because of the war, was living outside the borders of his or her country and who wanted to but could not return home or find a new home without assistance. This was the definition that the allies employed to categorize the displaced persons after the war. So Jewish DPs who had made the decision to stay in Germany thus faced a choice. They could remain in a DP camp, which was generally uh, German military barracks. And here's the map with the various DP camps, former POW and slave labor camps. 
tent cities, industrial housing, and the like. Or they could decide to leave a DP camp if they chose to settle in Germany permanently. And there were about 15,000 uh, German Jewish survivors who decided to return to their either former hometowns or cities to rebuild there. Although you can think about the dilemma that that would present, right? Would Jews actually want to remain in Germany of all places? Um, as I mentioned before, there was um, this a chaplain by the name of Abraham Klausner, who was incredibly active in the aftermath of the war in trying to help survivors get organized. And Klausner, uh, I, I've written an article about him because I find him to be such a fascinating figure in the aftermath of the war. He was a, a young reform rabbi, um, not, not even uh, 30 years old in 1945, when he arrived in the American zone of occupation. Um, and he basically went AWOL from his unit. He had been sent from uh, France down to uh, the region around Munich, told before he got there that there was, and this is what the, the original letter said, there's a congregation of Jews that needs your assistance. And he had no idea what that meant because he couldn't imagine what congregation of Jews this letter could be referring to in Munich at the end of the war. And what it meant was that they had liberated Dachau and there were a lot of Jews there that needed um, assistance. And so Klausner quickly sprung into action. And in the first month after liberation, he visited approximately 14,000 Jews living in 17 displaced persons camps one month after liberation. And he reported in a letter back to his superiors that uh, he found deplorable conditions, poor accommodations, no plumbing, no clothing, rampant disease, continuing malnourishment, basically a lack of any plan on the part of the Amer American military. As he wrote in a letter to his supervisor, Philip Bernstein, he said, quote, liberated but not free. That is the paradox of the Jew. And Klausner, as I mentioned, he, he passed away in 2007. He had arrived in Dachau shortly after liberation and he was assigned to handle death certificates and burials, but it soon became apparent that he would be the main point man for Jewish refugees struggling with hardship and despair even after liberation. And so one of Klausner's first tasks among many um, was to begin making lists of survivors he realized that there were all these Jews who had survived. And the first question that they wanted to find out was, had anyone else uh, survived, right? Had anybody else from their family survived? In fact, Klausner told a story when he first got to Dachau, um, he entered one of the, one of the barracks where uh, Jews had been confined um, with the sort of triple decker uh, bunks. And there was a voice as he entered the barrack that uh, called to him from one of the upper uh, one of the upper bunks, asking him, "Are you in in German or either Yiddish? I don't know." Asking him, "Are you an American?" And he said, "Yes." And he said, "I heard you're a rabbi." And Klausner said, "Yes." And then the voice said to him, "Maybe you know my brother." And Klausner thought to himself, "How would I know this uh, this gentleman's brother?" And they said, "Well, his name is Abraham Spiro." And he is a chaplain just like you. And he managed to immigrate to America before the war began. And Klausner said, I do know your brother. And they were both chaplains and he was able to reunite this uh, surviving Jew with his brother who was a chaplain. And from this moment, Klausner decided that his mission was to, as he said it, reunite brothers, bring families back together. So he started to make this list of survivors in order to reunite families. And he urged soldiers to provide food for the Jewish population. He commandeered hospitals for the use of Jewish refugees. He used uh, the employ uh, he employed the military mail service in defiance of U.S. Army regulations to help Jews find their families. In a testimony that he gave many years after the war, he recalled developing a tracing service for the survivors. And basically, they just would make lists of the names of survivors who had survived. And they published it in this volume, which came to be called the Sheri Taplita, or the Surviving Remnant. Um, and they published multiple volumes of just lists upon lists of names. 
Um, and he in fact got the name for this, the Sheri Tapleta. He took it from, he said he always had a love of the prophets. And the prophet Micah, um, after the destruction of the temple, had prophesy that after the destruction, there would be um, a surviving remnant, right? And this term, Sherita Pleta, which referred to the surviving remnant in the times of the prophets that would remain after the destruction of the temple, Klausner thought that this also referred to the surviving remnant after the destruction of European Jewry. And so this was the name that they gave to this project, the Sherita Pleta project. And they would put these lists of names in the Deutsches Haus Museum in Munich, which became sort of the headquarters of their operation. And survivors literally from all over Europe were streaming into the American zone of occupation, trying to come to Munich just to look at these names lists to see if anybody had managed to, um, to survive. As he described, here you can see uh, an example of Klausner happened to be very involved with a, um, a Lithuanian Jewish rabbi by the name, uh, Lithuanian Jewish doctor, sorry, by the name of Zalman Grinberg who uh, was liberated from Kaufering, which was a satellite camp near Dachau. And Grinberg helped establish the first Jewish hospital for survivors at St. Ottilian, which had been a Benedictine monastery in Bavaria. And it also became a site to first organize survivors after the war. And you can see here a picture of two brothers who found each other in St. Ottilian at the hospital um, after, after the war. Um, now, while organizing amongst themselves, the DPs and chaplains like Klausner continued to describe the poor conditions that survivors were facing. And um, Klausner was writing letters back to uh, his supervisor in the United States describing the poor conditions. This doctor that I referenced, Zalman Grinberg, who was among one of the early leaders of the surviving population, also wrote letters to the World Jewish Congress, to the Joint Distribution Committee, to anyone that they could get their attention to describe the poor conditions that survivors were facing. In a letter that Grinberg wrote at the end of May of 1945 to the World Jewish Congress, he noted his disappointment with the slow arrival of relief. He said, it has been four weeks since our liberation and no representative of the Jewish world no representative from any Jewish organization has come to be with us after the worst tragedy of all time, to speak with us, to give us help, and to lighten our burden. We must ourselves, with our own diminished strength, help ourselves. And indeed, there was a sense of resentment, um, but also a sense that if the outside world was not going to come in to help them, that the survivors resolved that they had to help themselves. Now, what they didn't know in the, this initial period after liberation was that the fact that this was a liberated military zone um, that had been liberated by the US Army made it difficult for relief organizations to gain entry. So the primary Jewish relief organization in this space was the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. And the joint, it took them three months from May of 1945 till August of 1945 to gain access to the American zone of occupation to begin to do the work that they needed to do to help um, the liberated uh, surviving Jewish population. But this early period also played a critical role in the survivors themselves basically beginning to organize themselves um, to advocate for themselves. So Klausner played an important role working together with Zalman Grinberg to organize something which came to be called the Central Committee of Liberated Jews. And the Central Committee of Liberated Jews became the administrative representative body of the surviving population to talk to the US Army, to talk to the United Nations, to advocate um, for themselves. And indeed by September of 46, the Central Committee was recognized by the US Army as the legal and democratic representative of the liberated Jews in the American zone. They uh, made Klausner their honorary, um, their, their honorary sort of uh, president. Zalman Grinberg was the official president. Um, and this enduring sort of independence and vocal independence would become a defining feature, feature of the surviving population. 
eventually Klausner's letters, Grinberg's letters, letters that were sent by surviving, um, by survivors themselves, letters that were sent by American Jewish GIs had an impact. And finally, um, in the summer of 1945, President Truman dispatched Earl Harrison, who was uh, his envoy um, to examine, uh, uh, Harrison had been a member of the Intergovernmental Committee on Refugees, uh, Truman dispatched Harrison as his envoy to the liberated zone to examine the situation that was being reported on for the surviving population. And Harrison issued this uh, report in uh, September of 1945. In fact, here's a picture of Earl Harrison visiting uh, the Bergen-Belsen DP camp. And he visited various DP camps and he issued this report in, in September of 1945 on the plight of the displaced Jews in Europe. It's come to be known as the Harrison Report. And you can see this cover, the document that stirred the world. Because what Harrison reported was that yes, in fact, the American military had been ill-equipped to deal with the surviving population. They had a plan for winning the war, but they didn't have a plan for how to um, treat the refugee population after the war, which they had expected would return to their home countries. Harrison issued this scathing report in which he said, and I'll quote, as matters now stand, we appear to be treating the Jews as the Nazis treated them, except that we do not exterminate them. They are in concentration camps in large numbers under our military guard instead of SS troops. And you can imagine what sort of an impact a report by the American government envoy, a statement like that would have. Um, in his report, he made a number of concrete suggestions for how to improve the situation of the surviving population. He said, first and foremost, we cannot force the displaced Jews to be living with former collaborators anymore. We have to allow the Jews to have their own Jewish displaced persons camps. They have to administer themselves. They have to have autonomy. They can't be forced to live with Lithuanians and Poles and Ukrainians. Give them their own Jewish DP camps. Furthermore, he said, we have to uh, create a position in the American military of the advisor for Jewish affairs. And the advisor for Jewish affairs will explain to our military government exactly what it is that the Jews need. And third point, which became a really important point in post-war diplomacy, he said, I have a very easy solution to the problem of the surviving Jewish population, the displaced Jews. Where should we send them? Well, it's evident to me. We should give them 100,000 immigration certificates and they should be allowed to immigrate to Palestine because I've interviewed the surviving population and 95% of them, when I ask them, where do you wanna go? They say, we'd like to live in the land of Israel. And this is a really important recommendation because it puts the resolution of the surviving Jewish population, the displaced Jews in Europe, um, it makes the question of Palestine part of the diplomatic solution to what to do with the surviving population in Europe. Now, of course, as we'll see, there is there are a couple of parties that uh, do not advocate for this as a solution. One is the British who are in Palestine now and are having a difficult time controlling uh, the brewing conflict between the Arab population in Palestine and the Jewish population in Palestine. Um, and so, but the British also owe a debt of gratitude to the Americans. And so they can't just reject this out of hand. So they um, say, you know what we should do? We'll propose a commission to study the situation, um, which is what's done. And it ends up being called the Anglo-American Committee of Inquiry, which I'll come back to. Um, but under after, um, after Harrison's report, the Americans respond swiftly and General Dwight D. Eisenhower, um, who is sort of the uh, general in charge of the American zone of occupation, um, they respond swiftly. They recognize the Jews as a distinct nationality. They put them in separate Jewish displaced persons camps um, and they commit to aiding their eventual migration from Germany. Uh, by, 19, by the end of 1945, the DP camps, the Jewish DP camps are overseen by the United Nations, UNRWA, Relief and Rehabilitation, and the Joint Distribution Committee has a system to provide daily rations, clothing, medication, and education for the surviving uh, population. Um, 
And the first, uh, uh, the first advisor for Jewish affairs is appointed after the Harrison Report uh, by the name of uh, Judah Nadich. Um, now, Nadich becomes, in a sense, an unofficial spokesman uh, for, uh, you know, to Jewish newspapers and reports on conditions facing the Jewish survivors um, in Europe. But the truth is that this early work that is done helps the surviving population in the Central Committee to essentially represent themselves before the American authorities, which becomes a really important sort of factor of this post-war um, situation. And truthfully, one of the most important things that this early period does is it helps the survivors um, essentially advocate in order to help um, themselves. Klausner uh, ends up being instrumental in helping um, organize the Central Committee of Liberated Jews. The Central Committee of Liberated Jews, which oversees administrative affairs for every different Jewish DP camp, works together with UNRWA, and you can see here in this picture, you have a representative of the United Nations and the American military and the Joint Distribution Committee to get the survivors what they need for each um, DP camp. And I'm happy to discuss this in the Q&A, sort of the dynamics of how this situation works in the post-war um, period. Uh, it's not always smooth. Um, there is a lot of Jewish literature and civilization in the in the 1940s and 50s, but Leo Schwartz was also a very important um, figure in the Joint Distribution Committee, and he, for about a year in 1946, was the director of the um, American Zone of uh, JDC operations in the American Zone, and he and Klausner, who you can see here, did not get along at all, and in fact. Uh, Schwartz got so tired of Klausner's constant sort of complaining, saying the JDC was not doing enough, uh, you know, complaining on behalf of the survivors, organizing letter writing campaigns back to the United States, saying the JDC is not doing enough, that um, uh, Schwartz basically organized to have Klausner kicked out of the American zone of occupation. He had him sent back to the United States. And we could talk about this episode, but you could see like sort of the tensions between different people who thought they knew uh, what was best for the surviving population. Um, what, what does end up happening though, is that in this period of time, a number of significant things begin to happen with um, the organization, both politically and administratively of the surviving population. On the diplomatic level, the assistance that's offered by the GIs and the chaplains um, and the surviving population that's organized into these separate DP camps begins to make it clear that um, this is on the one hand, a surviving population that is quite Zionist, meaning that one of the conclusions that the surviving population reaches in the aftermath of the war is that there is no future for them in Europe. And as long as the possibility of immigration to the United States is continues to be restricted, which it is at least till 1950. Some people managed to get in in 46, 47, 48, but the US does not change its immigration policy overall until 1950, means that the best possibility of departure is Israel or Palestine at the time. And the Jewish agency, represented here in this photograph by David Ben-Gurion, realizes much to their surprise that the surviving population can play a very important role in their advocacy for the creation of the Jewish state. Um, and so Ben-Gurion visits the DP camps. This is already in the fall of 1945. Um, he visits the DP camps in the fall of 1945 um, and he's pleasantly surprised by the Zionist enthusiasm. He's surprised by the way in which he's greeted by the surviving population who sort of looks at him as the king of, king of the Jews and he helps to outline a plan to bring not just thousands, but over 100,000 surviving Jews from Eastern Europe to the American zone of occupation. And this is something that's called the Bricha. It is a move, the movement of escape or departure. Jews who have survived in Poland, Jews who have survived in the former Soviet Union have been organizing 
from the moment after liberation to try to get Jews out of Poland and the Soviet Union. And they worked together with the Jewish agency basically to create a pipeline, think of it like an underground railroad, to get Jews to the American zone of occupation. And Ben-Gurion realizes that this can be very helpful in increasing pressure for American support for the Zionist solution and eventually increasing pressure on the British um, to advocate for the creation of a Jewish state. Um, one of the, the key sort of symbolic aspects of this that convinces everyone that the surviving population is ardently Zionist is uh, represented by this example that I gave you in the beginning of the agricultural training farms that are created. And you can think about the symbolism of this. So this is a farm that is created not long after liberation, um, after Kibbutz Bochenwald, it's called Kibbutz Nili. And these are the young survivors that I pointed to in the, in the first picture. And Kibbutz Nili is an agricultural training farm that is um, created uh, not just on any sort of former Nazi's estate. Let me see if I have a picture of him here. It's created on the estate of this man, Julius Streicher. Julius Streicher is one of the foremost Nazi anti-Semites, publisher of Der Stürmer, which had sort of the most vile uh, Nazi propaganda and anti-Semitic propaganda on its masthead. It said the Jews are our misfortune. Streicher was tried at Nuremberg after the war. He was uh, one of those who was convicted of incitement to um, genocide crimes against humanity and eventually hung. But you can think about the symbolism of this that as he's sitting trial in Nuremberg, you have these young survivors who have taken over his farm and turned it into a kibbutz, a Zionist agricultural training farm where they are essentially preparing themselves for their future lives in what they hope will be the land of Israel, speaking Hebrew, um, exacting what we can think of as a type of symbolic revenge on the Nazis, right? So this is the Passover Seder, the first Passover Seder in April of 1946, where on the wall here it says, from slavery to redemption, right? And they're sort of enacting this idea of their uh, going from slavery to um, redemption. And there are 40 of these farms that are created in the American zone of occupation after liberation. Thousands of young people come to live on these farms. It's a very powerful symbolic image in terms of convincing outside observers of the degree to which the surviving population is enthusiastic about this as a solution to their, to their plight. Um, marching through German towns, this is Zionist youth uh, marching through German towns after the war. Now I should mention that the demography of the surviving population is also significant for us to bear in mind because you can see here, and I alluded to this before, that um, something like 86% of the original liberated surviving population, and this is sort of a representative sample, um, is, is between this age of 18 to 44. And it makes sense. And, and the truth is that the vast majority are between the ages of 17 to 35 um, when you drill down into the data. And it makes sense because that's who would have been likely to survive. But it also is a population that is, for the most part, orphaned. Uh, they've lost all their family members. They have nothing that's connecting them to Europe, nothing to return to. And a lot of them gravitate to Zionist frameworks after the war, which is providing at least some type of a replacement family, a surrogate family of sorts, and a type of hope for their future. Um, and we can talk about this in the Q&A. It, it, Zionism is very appealing for the surviving population, not necessarily because uh, they were so Zionist or only Zionist and believed that they needed to create the Jewish state before the war, but it made sense based on their conclusions after the war. And it also provided a type of a belonging to a movement and a surrogate family in the aftermath of the war. You'll also see here though, and this is important, that the demography of the surviving population changes in the first years after the war as more and more um, infiltrates, that's what they're referred to by the American army, those who are infiltrating from the East. And so um, you have, babies arriving, new families being created, uh, families who survived together in the Soviet Union during the war, which begins to change the nature of the surviving population. 
The other thing that happens after, um, and this, you know, I won't go into this now, but most of what this shows is the vast majority of the survivors are from Poland. Um, but you also have Jews who come from the Soviet Union, a smaller number that grows in 47 and 48 from Hungary and Romania. And um, most Jews from Germany and Western Europe do not stay in the DP camps. They're more likely to try to return to their home um, communities. But one of the interesting dynamics of what begins to happen as Jews are living in the DP camps. So in 1945, they think that within a year, they're gonna be moving somewhere else. By 1946, they see that they're now here for another, for two years. By 1947, it's been two years. By 1948, it's been three years. The time begins to drag on and on. And so one of the fascinating things about this DP period is you see on the one hand, large number of weddings of survivors in the immediate aftermath, people eager to restart their families in the aftermath of the war. Um, in 1946 to 47, the surviving population has, according to some estimates, the highest per capita birth rate of any population in the world, right? There is what's been referred to as the DP baby boom um, between 1946 and 1947. And this makes sense too, right? Um, as, as one survivor noted, in the first year after liberation, it was all lonely single people. By the second year, everyone was walking around with a baby carriage, right? People got married quickly. They wanted to restart families quickly. They wanted to have uh, restart the future of the Jewish people quickly. They wanted to have babies, right? And sort of um, uh, one of my uh, colleagues, Atina Grossman, refers to this also as a type of, quote, biological revenge, right? Um, to show the Germans, to show the Nazis, in the, as the song goes, mir sein in do, right? We are here. Um, you, you tried to destroy us, you couldn't, we are here. And what's amazing is that after years of trauma and loneliness, the surviving population, the Sharita Plita, converts the DP camps not only into places of sort of family rebirth and um, you know children being born and baby booms, but it, they also become active cultural and social centers. And despite what are often bleak conditions in the DP camps, we see a lot of social and occupational organizations abounding. Journalism springs up in all sorts of ways in the DP camps. There's over 170 different newspapers and journals that are published that attest to a very vibrant sort of literary culture in the DP camps. People are looking for things to do. They're writing, they're reading, they're creating art, um, they're creating theater. Youth movements are incredibly uh, active. Um, and there's also a culture of memorialization, remembering what happened during the war, documenting what happened uh, during the war. Sports clubs become very popular as people look for things to do and also demonstrate that they have reclaimed their bodies, they've reclaimed their strengths um, in the aftermath of the war. Um, uh, you know, I'm going to. Uh, vocational training workshops are open to train survivors for their future careers and wherever they uh, end up moving to. Um, historical commissions are opened up in the DP camps. This you can see as a poster of the Central Historical Commission in the American Zone of Germany. I'll just go back for a second. And the poster says, remember what Amalek did unto you. Zachor et asher asalacha Amalek. So we have the biblical imperative to remember, to zachor, but now we Jews have an obligation, just as we did in previous moments in our history, to remember, right? And in Yiddish here at the bottom, it says, zamult unfarzeichent, collect and record. And it's telling the survivors to document, to create testimonies, to create the future written record for um, Jews of the future who will know about this most recent destruction. Um, the truth is, and this is quite remarkable, that in many ways the surviving population sets the agenda for, um, sets the agenda for, uh, you know, historical documentation efforts in the future, um, uh, which they begin these collecting and recording projects. The Central Committee of Liberated Jews, the collections that they make, eventually um, are copied and sent to Yad Vashem, 
and to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in New York. And these become some of the foundational documentation projects about the history of the Holocaust. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. There's a lot of work that's done among survivors in the DP camps to commemorate, to memorialize, to write the history, to um, enact uh, some different forms of Jewish revenge. So you can see here, this is Purim and the Landsberg DP camp in March of 1946, when the modern day Haman sort of meets his, meets his due, right? And there's a Jewish joke that was circulating uh, during the war among Jews, um, that a joke that was told about Adolf Hitler, who was asking his advisors, you know, um, am I going to die? And they said, yes, you're going to die. And, and, and he said, well, when am I going to die? And they said, well, you're going to die on a Jewish holiday. And um, he said, yes, but on what Jewish holiday am I going to die? And his advisor said to him, any day you die will be a Jewish holiday. <laughs> and so you can think about after the war, survivors <laughs> getting to basically say like, we are celebrating the death of, of Haman, right? And, and this is in the DP camps, right? Think about that first Purim. Um, what that must have must have been like. Um, they're observing holidays. They're thinking about um, you know the exodus from Egypt as they've just had their own exodus from concentration camps, and they're sitting you know in the DP camps for two years, three years, entertaining each other. You have music groups, you have theatrical groups that are created, all sorts of um, you know it's it's incredibly rich and vibrant period to study when we think about the rebirth of Jewish life in the aftermath of the war. And just to wrap up, I'll just say that one of the other things that's incredibly fascinating about this period is the role that eventually the surviving population ends up playing in the eventual creation of the state of Israel. Because if we think about the sort of diplomacy of the linkage of this, what to do with the survivors of the creation of the state, by 1947, the problem of Palestine is referred over to the United Nations by the British. They sort of throw up their hands and they say, we can't deal with this anymore. And the United Nations is studying the question of what to do with Palestine. And it is very much a component of their calculations, the drama of the Exodus, which is a boat of 4,500 Holocaust survivors who try to break the British blockade of Palestine in July of 1947, and are forcibly returned to Germany by the British, this plays an influence on the United Nations decision eventually by November of 1947, when they say the only fair solution is to partition Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. And they reference specifically the plight of the surviving population in Europe as one of the reasons to create um, the Jewish state. So for the survivors after the war, um, it, it, I would just point out that it's an incredibly sort of resilient population. It's an incredibly active population. It's vocal, it's independent. This desire to return, as they say here, you can see young people saying, we want to go back to our homes and land of Israel, ends up playing a major role in diplomatic decisions that are reached in the aftermath of, of the war. Um, I'm gonna leave it off there. I've, I've given you a lot of food for thought on sort of why I think it's so important to pay attention to survivors after the war in this incredibly rich period of time between 1945 and 48. We think about the end of World War II and 45. We think about the creation of the state in 1948, but I wanna make sure that we don't lose sight of this very rich period of time between 45 and 48. Thank you. Uh, amazing. You're right. That that is a whole area that sometimes is uh, not dealt with, even in courses. Um, I know in our course, I don't think we spend as much time as we could, and this is going to help us. A colleague and I will probably talk about it. Um, anyway, um, please uh, questions for Dr. Pat. Some of them are in the chat. I think. I'm gonna I'm gonna open the chat and I'm gonna um, see some of the things that. Um... That have been posted here already. Um, that's amazing. Somebody said their father was one of the liberators of Buchenwald, and I think, you know, I wanted to mention that, you know, here we are, uh, the day after Veterans Day, um, and I think one of the sort of poignant aspects of of all of this is we're 75 years after liberation, um, 
this year. And we know that sort of that generation, both what we refer to here in the United States as the greatest generation, you know, those who liberated the concentration camps, and then also the survivors, right, were sort of living through the passing of, of that generation. So it's incredibly important to document this. Um, yes, yes Dr. Ellie. Um, one yeah, thing go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm the son of, 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 my dad was one of the liberators and uh, I know Howard quite well. And it still affects me. I can't, for example, even now, I, I mean, I'm the son and what he didn't say very much and everything that you shared resonated with me from beginning to end, but he had a, um, a very soft nature and yet he was extremely courageous and he volunteered his guys to go in and be the first to go into the camp. And um, he told me that um, it's nothing that can be explained. He just couldn't explain it. He said it was definitely hell. And I, years later I met Ellie Wiesel and became friendly with him because he was in Buchenwald and he me remembered my dad and, and, the, and the American soldiers. He told me that when he wrote the uh, Perils of Indifference he, he visualized my father in the, in, the, in, the, in the Americans. And in the very beginning of that speech, I, uh, I failed his speech, but he talks about that, that the American soldiers couldn't believe it. They couldn't, no one could believe it. But I want to say thank you for, for this because it's, it's part of my DNA. This is, it, it still affects me. And, um, and just your tone of voice and the way that you were able to explicate um, affected me deeply too. So thank you very, very much. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing that. And I think, you know, one of the things you point out is the um, a lot of the you know that we we use that term like beyond belief, right? And and a lot of the liberators try to, as you suggest, they couldn't quite articulate something that literally was sort of beyond belief. They couldn't imagine that human beings could do this to other human beings. And I think. Part of that, I mean, one of the, the challenges both for survivors and I think for the liberators was there was such a tendency to not talk about it or maybe talk about it amongst themselves, right? So liberators could, could talk about it amongst themselves because they knew what they had seen and survivors could talk about it amongst themselves. But for people who were not there, there was such a chasm, right? Of, you know, language failed them to explain what that world was like. Right, and I think that's one of the challenges. Is, is, it's not necessarily that people didn't want to talk about. It. They couldn't literally sort of. And Wiesel talks about this about how language, um, you know, doesn't. You don't have the words to to explain um, what they had endured or what they had seen. Um, I want to scroll down to some of the other questions. So someone asked, and please forgive me if I skip any questions. Someone asked about, um, Howard says, what accounts for the delay in getting help into the American run uh, DPs? And I think it's a really good question because um, it does create um, some resentment on, on the part of the surviving population. And and I think, so as I suggested, you know, one of their, there's some like very just technical issues that, that account for the delay and in particular you know the joint the JDC um, would have been the the best organized the number one American Jewish organization to gain access uh, to to the um, you know liberated zones of, of, of occupation after the war and um, it takes time for them to be able to get in because it's a military zone it's an occupied military zone and Yehuda Bauer has written about this and others have written about this this three month period where it takes till August. Um, and that that period of time that it takes till August for the JDC to get in there and get organized is a really long three months in terms of sort of survivors saying like, where are you, where were you? And that also builds on um, a layer of resentment that actually was had built up during the war. That this doesn't often get talked about, but among survivors who sort of um, were wondering, they thought that, you know, the world would scream, the world would come to their aid, that the civilized world would not allow this to happen. And when the war was over, there was that divide, right, between sort of, why did you leave us for this to happen? Where did you, why didn't you come sooner, right? And, and we know all the technical difficulties of that, but I think that sort of divide um, was, was really important, um, both in the immediate aftermath of the war, and then 
in years after about sort of difficulties between in survivors and communicating with with the countries that they ended up in. I will mention that, and I didn't mention this in my remarks. So there were there were like chaplains and GIs who did play a really important role in helping survivors after the war. And then the other group that I didn't mention is an interested in sort of little known history is there were soldiers from Palestine um, from a unit called the Jewish Brigade that also were among the first Jews to encounter survivors after the war. And the Jewish Brigade was a, um, a small Jewish unit of the British army that made its way so that British did not allow them to see fighting during the war. Um, they were in Northern Italy at the time of liberation. And then they traveled through Germany and Austria after liberation and ended up being um, stationed in Belgium after the war. And the British military, so there are very vivid descriptions of the brigade coming through the concentration camps after liberation, trying to offer help and support to survivors after the war. And then the brigade soldiers also play an important role in helping survivors get organized, helping the Zionist movements get organized. Um, but there's a reason that the British didn't want them to stay in Germany after the war. And one of the main reasons was there was a very, there was a fear of um, revenge operations that were gonna take place, um, that uh, the brigade would organize revenge operations, that surviving Jews would organize revenge operations. And actually this, this happened, it doesn't get talked about very much, but um, like there's the famous case of, um, the, the survivor from Vilna, Abba Kovner, who tried to organize a mass revenge operation. You know, he wanted to poison 6 million Germans after the war as revenge, and this never happened, um, but they, they tried to organize revenge. And um, so this, you know, I didn't talk about it, but this was another part of sort of the post-war atmosphere. We have Germans and Jews living side by side, and some Jews wanted to take revenge, and some said, no, we, you know, our revenge should be in, make building life anew or in, in, in building a Jewish state in the land of Israel. Um, so uh, somebody asks here, so that's interesting about um, the, the uh, founders of World Ort. Uh, thank you. And Ort, yeah, plays an important role after the war in creating, in creating vocational training opportunities. Um, WCS writes, you mentioned, I might get back to, oh, how Klausner went AWOL. Um, he is, and I would, I'd be happy to share this around this article on, on Klausner. Um, he's yeah, such please, a, yes, yeah, he's such an interesting character. Um, so, uh, in short, he, um, is, you know, stationed with this unit in Munich. Um, they move on after two weeks and he said, there's no way I'm leaving here. And, um, so he defies orders. He says, I have to stay in Munich. I have to help these survivors from Dachau get organized. And eventually he gets permission, but initially he goes AWOL because he says, I'm not, I'm not staying with my unit. I'm staying here with these survivors. Um, and uh, Klausner, you know, breaks all kinds of rules. As I said, he, um, you know, commandeers the, mil the, uh, the, the uh, postal service for, you know, creating these lists. He actually, so I didn't mention this, but um, this names list project that it's that he creates, which is called the Sherita Pleita, it's based in Landsberg, um, which is a, the town. Uh, it's not far from Munich. It's um, you know in Bavaria. It's a small town in Bavaria. Um, Landsberg becomes the home of the largest, the first uh, Jewish DP camp, the largest Jewish DP camp, which is called Landsberg. Um, it's near this military hospital that becomes a Jewish hospital, St. Ottilian, um, where Zalman Grinberg is operating. And Landsberg is also significant in German history because it's the, does anybody know why else, what else Landsberg is significant for in German history? So when Hitler um, tries his beer hall putsch in oh, Munich, in November of 1923, um, he eventually is imprisoned in Landsberg. Right, right. Now I mention this because when Klausner has his names list of the surviving Jews, the Sherry Tapleta, printed, he has it printed in Landsberg, and it's the same printer that prints Mein Kampf, which Hitler writes and publishes 
after his imprisonment in Landsberg, the same printer that prints Mein Kampf also prints this list of the names of surviving Jews, right? So think about like layers of revenge. Um, it's incredible. Um, and I think Klausner knew this and he's like this, we're gonna, we're gonna get our revenge in this way. Um, Howard asks, can you comment on the governance structure in the DP camps? Kibbutzim are collectives, but were other camps more top down? Did the zones vary in administrative structure? It's a great, great question. Um, and uh, so it's it's very interesting. I mean, there is a, a complete bureaucracy that is created um, in every single DP camp. Um, that uh, so there's there is a central committee of liberated Jews. Um, and now I'm just going to talk about the Jewish administrative structure. There's a central committee of liberated Jews um, in the American zone that is based in Munich. Um, it sort of oversees all of these uh, DP camps that are in Bavaria in particular, but also in, in other parts of the American zone. Um, and then each DP camp has its own um, has its own uh, administrative structure. So it has its own camp committee. I mention this because it gets really political because they have democratic elections to administer affairs for the DP camp committees. And um, almost every single political party in the DP camps is Zionist. So you have the whole you know, spectrum of the Zionist political parties. They're all left-wing Zionist political parties. Um, the only non-Zionist political party in the DP camps is Agudas Yisrael, uh, the ultra-Orthodox, um, you know, sort of, they, there was a pre-war political party um, in Poland. And I mention this because the Jewish Labor Bund, which had been so popular in pre-war Poland, uh, is not represented among the political parties in post-war Germany in the DP camps. Um, and they basically, you know, this has to do with this idea, like the, the labor bones ideology before the war was, we're going to help in the building of a socialist Jewish state, um, you know, in Poland and a free and democratic and socialist Poland. And this is our home and Poland has been our home for a thousand years. And the labor bund, it's very hard for them to make that argument after the war. So those bundes who are arguing for, you know, rebuilding Poland stay in Poland uh, or they go to New York. Um, and those Jews who are in the DP camps, by and large, have given up on the idea of staying in Poland. And it's, so it's very overwhelmingly Zionist. Um, the kibbutzim are a separate administrative unit in the sort of DP. So there are DP camps, and then there are kibbutz groups that are overseen by the Zionist youth movements. And then some of them move out to agricultural training farms, and they all get rations from the joint. So the JDC is counting like, where are the Jews? How many Jews do you have? We'll give you rations. And that's the camp committees report back to the joint and they say, we need this many number of rations to feed people. Um, and I could tell you like it gets complicated back and forth. You know, the joint accuses the camp committees of double counting, which of course they do. They over report the number of Jews that they have in their camps so they can get more rations. So um, this definitely happened and, you know, rations also become a point of like, you have a little power depending on how many rations you can give out. So, and there's a whole black market trade that's going on because the Jews through the rations are getting cigarettes from the joint. And so the Jews are taking these cigarettes and trading them on the black market with Germans for currency. So it's very, it's a lot, a lot of this is going on um, in post-war Germany. When you mentioned uh, the joint doing the rationing, what did the United States government provide? Um, yeah, so they basically, the deal was that um, the, the United States government sort of was an overarching structure. Um, they provided all the sort of um, helped administer to the housing needs, they helped administer to the security needs, they helped administer sort of the, the operation of the camps. There was a, there was a cooperation between um, the army, the United Nations, and let's remember, right? So I just was talking about the Jewish DP camps, and there were all sorts of other DP camps for other displaced persons um, that the US Army and the United Nations were overseeing, right? So it was a very complicated sort of period um, after the war. And 
it's also important because, you know, by 48, the United States Army has other bigger issues to deal with. Um, like think about the growing Cold War, the partition, you know, the, the Iron Curtain that is beginning to descend across Europe. And they're starting to be much more worried about that and less concerned with dealing with, you know, these Jews who they just want to, at some point, want to get out of Germany. And I think this might explain to us some of the American support for a Zionist solution after the war too, right? This will help us facilitate the migration of the Jews out of Germany so we can focus on the bigger issues here, which is the threat of communism. Right by 48, this is like the major, the major focus. Right. I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, I, it seems curious to me that um, many of these photos you showed us were from the displaced people working on farms. And I, I kind of understand better going to an organization like ORT because they were training them to create new occupations. But it's not like the Jews' history involves a lot of land ownership. And was, am I being paranoid? I mean, no. was there a reason that they also wanted them on farms that they would be out of the cities and sort of isolated from the general population? That's a very interesting um, theory. So I, I find this also quite fascinating, right? Like there's not, you know, for, for the reasons of European Jewish history, um, there's not a long legacy of, of farming among Jews, right? Um, right. And specifically for the reasons you pointed to. Um, and so who are the, you know, from an ideological standpoint, there are a couple of groups that were advocating for Jews to join farms long before World War II, right? And so one was uh, the Zionists who sort of, this was an important part of, you know, um, building the Jewish state and a people, a uh, normal people needs to engage in agricultural labor to connect to the soil. and. So that was like the Zionist side of things. Um, and then you had uh, in the United States, you know, some of you might be familiar with like this history of Jewish farmers in the United States where at the beginning of the 20th century, there were American organizations that were really worried that there were, there was dense overcrowding and too many Jews living in urban areas like on the Lower East Side of Manhattan where you had half a million Jews in tenement houses and whatever. And so like the Baron de Hirsch, you know, they're, they're, and the Jewish Territorial Association, they said, oh, let's just send them to farms, right? It'll be so healthy. And you have in Connecticut and New Jersey, like Jewish farms that are created, chicken farmers, uh, but it doesn't last long, right? It's usually one a one generation endeavor. Um, and so it is curious when you look at post-war Germany and you see these farms that are created. And so it's, it's very much um, an operation that is supported by the Zionist youth movements who are um, sort of looking at it as this will help train our young people for their future in the land of Israel, right? So it's very much like we'll train them to be on kibbutzim. And then it is seen to be something that can be a productive use of time, a way to be healthy, get out of a camp, because you've just probably spent two or three years in a camp, like the last place you want to be is in a camp. You're unemployed, you're idle, so at least you can be productive in your use of time. Now, it is disproportionately young people who are sent out. So I don't want to create a mistaken perception. Like out of 150,000 or so Jews in the American zone at any one given time, the most that I found living on a farm at any one given time is probably about five or 6,000 people living on farms, right? So um, the vast majority of the surviving population is in DP camps or you know, in cities, um, but the young people, the Zionist youth movements are really focused on getting the young people out onto these farms so that they can get them to kibbutzim and when they move to Israel. And, you know, the Americans, like there's a perception that, you know, the ref these refugees are engaging in black market trade. So if we can keep them occupied, it'll, you know, prevent them from getting uh, into things that will get them into trouble or so-called criminal activity, um, which, you know, is a whole other story. But um, I think that kind of explains like why there is such a focus on on farming, especially for young people. Thank you. 
I have a question. Sure, I, please. Um, do you want to speak about the um, the anti-Semitism that Jews as a whole faced when they returned to their um, you know countries, cities, for example, in Poland? I think many of them were murdered, actually. Yeah. So thank you. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I alluded to it in the beginning, but and and it is a critical aspect of the the bricha, which I mentioned, right? So why do we end up having 150,000 or so Jews leaving Poland and migrating to Germany, Austria, and Italy? It is by and large because of the continuing anti-Semitism that they encounter, right? So um they it's encountered like, Poland too. In, po Poland in Poland, Poland. It's specifically in Poland, right? They 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 realize that there is no their families have been destroyed. And it's like those the young yeah. people in the diary of Kibbutz Buchenwald write about it. Because that also that entry in the diary is based on a very real experience of trying to go back to your hometown, um, looking for your family, realizing that they've been killed. And then people who were your former neighbors are looking at you like, why are you here? We thought you all died, right? You survived. And it's not a good you survived. It is sort of, uh, you know, stay away, don't come back. And part and of that is because- They took over their home. Exactly. They took over their home. Yeah. Took your property, took your business, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. your linens, your jewels, whatever was in your house is now in my house and we don't want you to, to take that back. Um, so, and and there are pogroms that break out after the war, right? So um, among the, uh, uh, you know, in Poland and it's not just the most famous of the pogroms is one that takes place in a town called Kielce in July of 1946. Um, yeah. And it, it is, the one a similar story, and actually Jan Gross has written a book about this not long ago right. called yeah. Fear. Um, and it's a it's similar to pogroms that broke out, you know, in the Russian Empire in the end of the 1800s, where it starts with a blood libel. It starts with the idea that uh, you know, the Jews, the Jews who had returned to Kielce had kidnapped a Christian child, and then they were going to use the blood for Passover yeah. sacrifices, right? And um, yeah. you know, the rumor quickly spreads. And then it turns into a, a pogrom where dozens of Jews are killed. Yeah. And But the truth is that even before Kielce, there had been other pogroms already in August of 45, there's a pogrom in Krakow where the surviving Jewish population is targeted, right? So not long after liberation, I mean, it becomes clear less than a year after liberation in Poland, parts that have been liberated in November of 44 or January of 45, that there's no future for the Jews here, right? That it's dangerous, that the Jews who have been liberated and there are Jews who are, they survive the war and then they're killed, um, yeah. you know? So that feeds an environment that is going to lead to the bricha, which literally means escape, right? Bricha means escape. We have to escape from Poland. And it brings these 100,000 Jews out of Poland into the DP camps of Germany. In Austria. Thank you. Do, do you have the to, what's the total number of survivors in general? Is there a number that, that people have? <sighs> it's a really good question, um, and I I um I'll tell you <clears throat> that I in this in this book. So I um, include a uh, in my chapter on on Jewish DPS. I include a chart and the sort of the best way to try to figure this out is so I include a chart in this in this chapter on um, the nature of the surviving population. Um, so how many Jews were counted in a country before the war and how many Jews were counted in a country after the war right. and the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum has a um, uh, an estimate of the numbers um, that you know we can sort of look at for this nature of the surviving population. Um, it's it's tricky because we use this number and you even saw it in one of the pictures, this number is 6 million, right? Um, we use a number and it's actually quite striking on that poster. I don't know if anybody noticed it but on the poster of the historical commission, they're using the number 6 million very soon after the end of the war to say 6 million Jews were killed. 
The best estimates suggest that somewhere between 5.7 and 6.3 million Jews are killed during the war, right? We use a number 6 million. It's not an exact number. Yeah. Um, and the only way to figure it out is to look country by country, how many Jews were before the war, how many Jews are there after the war. I say it's tricky because I just talked about the DP camps in Germany, Italy, and then Austria, where we estimate 250,000 Jews ended up in the DP camps. The tricky part is how many Jews survived in the Soviet Union? How many Jews survived who fled, let's say from Poland when the war broke out, survived in the Soviet Union during the war and then returned? And so it's hard to count exactly how many, you know, maybe there's, so Poland is an example where there, we estimate there were 3.3 million Jews in Poland before the war, 300,000 survive. So 3 million Jews were murdered, Polish Jews were murdered. Of those 300,000 who survived, some end up in the Soviet Union after the war, a lot of them end up in the DP camps after the war, but there's like constant movement. So that's where it's, you know, I'm sort of talking around it because it's very hard to give an exact number, but you have to go country by country, see how many were there before the war, how many were there after the war, and then try to come up with a calculation. Yeah, well, we have a, you know, a general idea that's not specific, but of course, it's always important when we have to deal with those deniers, you know, to, yeah. you know to be as yeah. specific as we can, obviously, which <clears throat> I know historians you like yourself and others have done the best they can right. with it. You know, that's pretty accurate. Um, anyway, any last questions from anybody? Uh, I think we have a lot of people still here, but thank you so much. Uh, this is, uh, to say the least, a uh, very important ad addition to our understanding of oh. this, uh, you know, this uh, the yeah, Holocaust. I want to thank you for the invitation, and um, it was a pleasure to to meet with all of you today. And I, uh, I only hope that we can do this in person at some point in Fall River. I'll be um, happy to uh, to to visit in person when I can. So oh, good. Well, we'll we we will definitely invite you, and hopefully we'll be back next year some <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so uh, everybody, be healthy, be yeah, safe. You too. Um, and. Somebody asked the book you. that I just referenced that, yeah. that recently yeah. came out is called Understanding and Teaching the Holocaust. So what's the uh, press for that? It's uh, Wisconsin. Oh, it's okay. part of the Harvey Goldberg series on understanding and teaching. Um, okay. So yeah. I'm definitely going to get, get that. All right. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And thanks to everybody to else for your, uh, for your attendance. And um, as I said, we will be having programming in the spring. You'll be uh, a list coming out, you know, at the beginning of the year. Great. Uh, and so uh, Great. we'll continue our work. Thank you. All right. Zai Thank you. Zai <laughs> Take care. You too.